I'm Stephen Bozarowski, I'm a professor of human geography at the University of Manchester, and I'm one of the project partners in the NPOR project. And NPOR is really, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is really the platform, the project under which we're organizing uh, all of this. So NPOR is basically a, a project that focuses on the private rented sector across Europe. Uh, the, the goal is really to understand and to quantify the rate of energy poverty in this sector. Uh, when we say energy poverty, we mean the inability to, uh, to secure the energy that is needed for a decent uh, life in the home. Um, and so, so we adopt a fairly broad definition of energy poverty in that sense. Um, our, our aim is really to understand the structural, um, the systemic underpinnings of energy poverty. Um, and and uh, to also improve the delivery of energy efficiency and also other measures to people who are in the private rented sector. Um, we, um, we want to make energy vulnerability in the private rented sector visible. And we also want to test schemes uh, that, um, that are aimed at, at people in the private rented sector. So the NPO project is led by the um, Institute for European Energy and Climate Policy. And there are, I'm not quite sure how many partners, but there are quite a few from all across Europe. Um, and um, we have a range of academic, um, practitioner organizations. We have, I'm just looking now, we have, I think, 14, no, 12 partners. Um, and we have um, um, representatives of uh, property owners, representatives of uh, the tenants, uh, we have regional agencies, experts, universities, and so on. So we are a very diverse consortium. So with, with that sort of very brief introduction, I now want to take us briefly through um, what the energy poverty dashboard is. And the dashboard basically is one of the elements of, of NPOR. And the idea is in line with those objectives that I mentioned before around visit making energy poverty visible around understanding um, the measures that are aimed at energy poor households. The idea is really to provide one hub, one central space where uh, we can see these uh, differences in energy poverty rates, but also the measures to fight energy poverty and also to create a kind of community of, um, of practice around it. So, at this point, um, my plan was not to use any slides, but as a reminder to myself, I do have just very two brief slides to just tell you a little bit more about, about the dashboard and also about some of the indicators that we are, we are using. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen um, and hopefully you can all see this. Um, right, so I'm just going to go to, yeah. So, there's basically four elements to why we have the energy poverty dashboard and reasons for it, really. So one of them is um, the fact that we don't have enough Europe-wide data on the private rented sector. Um, and and this, is a, this is something that even when we were putting the um, project application together, became very visible. Simply, um, we, um, the, the private rented sector is very hard to tackle. It's a very deep, very problematic, very challenging element of energy efficiency policies. And yet at the same time, we don't have enough information about who is vulnerable, where these vulnerabilities are and how we might address them. Uh, the second element to this equation is the fact that we don't have enough data that is sufficiently disaggregated. So we have some very broad uh, levels of information. At the European level, we have information sometimes that for some cities, but that sort of consistent regional disaggregation across years and across regions isn't present. So that's again one of the things that the, uh, the dashboard is trying to address. Um, we also don't have enough information on the kinds of initiatives, the kinds of interventions that uh, might, um, might be used to, um, to tackle private rented sector energy poverty. Um, and uh, at the moment there are a number of um, number of platforms, uh, starting from the work of the EU Energy Poverty Observatory and now through the Advisory Hub and other platforms that are mapping initiatives, but there isn't really a specialized place for private rented sector initiatives. So that's another thing we're trying to do, interventions, initiatives and so on. 
and more generally we want to have a platform where we can share knowledge and practice on this on this topic um i should say also uh, maybe this should be at the end but i do want to highlight it here um we we don't see the dashboard as just uh one a one a one stage project uh so the dashboard which will be presented to you soon um is is really something that is very much a work work in progress so um we want to develop the data we want to develop um the information that's there so our aim is are really to provide more detailed and more comprehensive data as the platform develops further so this is just the start think of it that way we also want to increase the scope and the scale of uh, of the hub so our, our goal is really to move beyond what's there now uh, and provide more information, but also ex expand the geographical um, reach of the of the dashboard. Uh, the idea is potentially to go um, globally, maybe, or to go and map other initiatives as well. That's why we call it generally an energy justice information hub, not just a dashboard for energy energy poverty. And we also want to create a community of practitioners, experts, citizens involved in this. So again, the speakers who will follow after me will expand on this. But uh, again, we, we want to create a dialogue around it. And, and indeed, this event is the beginning, we hope, of that of that dialogue. So my respected colleagues uh, who follow after me will tell you a little bit more about the content of the dashboard and also the indicators we use. But there is something um, something distinctive that I just do want to highlight which is that the dashboard for the first time for, um, um, for basically um, offers an indicator that uh, we call uh, REPI, so the Rented um, Private Housing Energy Poverty Indicator. So REPI is an indicator that captures energy poverty rates in a, let's say, composite way um, across the private rented sector, and it contains two parts, basically, as an indicator. Uh, one part is essentially um, the, the standard energy poverty indicators, three standard energy poverty indicators, which um, can be um, sourced from, uh, from Eurostat, uh, essentially the share of people who are unable to keep the home adequately warm, but only in the private rented sector, um, because we do have that data. Share of people who report utility bill, bill arrears in the private rented sector, uh, again, we have that data and also share of people who report housing faults, so poor quality housing um, indicators um, uh, such as damp, presence of damp, presence of mold, presence of rot in window frames or doors highlight that, uh, that poor quality of the housing. So those three we take together and uh, we basically develop a, a composite indicator in more or less equal parts. I should say that this third element is halved because it's not always indic an indicator of energy poverty. We consider, um, and this is in line with what the observatory has done before, we consider these two as primary indicators, the inability to keep the home adequately warm and the um, report, reporting of high, of high utility bills. These are all what we call consensual indicators, they're self-reported indicators. Uh, they do depend on um, what households say. There's a very long debate. I don't want to get into it now around what indicators do and what what they can say and what they tell. And of course, there are many limitations to this uh, from the source data to what the indicators actually do. But I don't, again, want to get into that discussion. I just also want to say that there is one final element of, of the REPI, and that's uh, the share of people who live in the private rented sector. So essentially, there are two components and we multiply that composite energy poverty indicator for the private rented sector with the size of the rented sector. So that means that the REPI will have different values depending on whether a country or a region has a high rented, high level of people living in the rented sector. And if it does, even if uh, these values are small, the REPI will have a greater value. And that's we just want to sh show with that that, um, that then it's a policy priority to, to tackle because that second element, you have a high element of um, of energy. You don't may not have maybe lots of energy poverty, but even if you have slightly higher energy poverty, but then huge rented sector, then it's something you need to do about. Uh, likewise, if you maybe have a low low uh, number of people living in the rented sector, and that's generally the case across large parts of um, Europe, particularly Eastern Europe, 
but those people are in lots of energy poverty, which the first part of the equation will show. Again, that shows that there is a policy priority. Again, I should just say this is a relatively crude, uh, relatively broad synthetic measure, but the idea is to try and capture some of these variations that across Europe exist across Europe and provide a background to, um, to the other element of the dashboard, which is where measures are present and exist. And again, as my colleagues will show, uh, that discrepancy uh, hopefully will become apparent in the dashboard because there will be regions where this is a huge policy priority, but there are not that many measures to fight energy poverty in the private rented sector. And that's, that's one of those um, elements of, of the dashboard that hopefully once we get more data, uh, we'll, we'll start to point to the need for policy in particular areas. Uh, now with that, I, I've overstepped, I've spoken for 30 minutes, so I do apologize, but I'm now going to pass on to Naomi Gerike, who is a researcher at the Wuppertal Institute uh, for, for Climate, for Klima, and uh, Naomi will, um, will tell us more about the indicators in the dashboard, I believe. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Stefan. Yes, um, yeah, my name is Naomi Gericke. I'm working at the Wuppertal Institute, I'm also a project partner of the NPOR Consortium. And I'd uh, like to also mention Florine von Dung, who is actually the main part of the team at Wuppertal Institute, but he cannot join today. Um, yeah, and I will now say some words about the databases for the indicators. Um, the indicators that have been included uh, in, in the dashboard were calculated using um, data from the EU statistical office. And uh, yeah, Stefan mentioned already that energy poverty can be captured under very uh, different considerations, as he said, from expenditure based uh, dimension or the question of um, the ability to keep your home warm or the condition of departments, health issues, etc. And so this range of possibilities is expressed in 11 different indicators that have been compiled here in the dashboard. It is a lot, but uh, yeah, as, as Stefan also said, uh, you can actually summarize or categorize uh, them into groups, um, groups that, uh, yeah, again, go along with uh, different surveys they, they come from. And basically it is um, those two groups that Stefan also mentioned, the consensual based or self-reported indicators, um, for example, the inability to keep the home warm or the presence of leak dam rot and so on. And um, these necessary data, they come from the EU SILC, uh, the European Union Statistics on Income and Living Conditions. Um, this is a, a weighted sample survey that is conducted annually by the different member states. Um, and it uh, provides EU-wide harmonized and comparable microdata to, to measure um, living conditions, poverty and social exclusion in the European Union. And uh, you may just mention that there are two sorts of data, um, cross-sectional data um, at, at a specific point in time and uh, longitudinal data on changes over time at an individual level. Um, and those are observed periodically um, over a specified time period, usually four years. Um, and in the dashboard now, we, we entered the data between 2004 and 2019. Um, this is a total of 3.5 million observations, roughly. Um, yeah, this is the SILIC EU data set. And then on the other hand, we have these um, expenditure-based indicators, such as the low absolute um, energy expenditure indicator or the low income high cost indicator. Um, these data, they come from the so-called HBS database, um, household uh, budget surveys. It is also a sample survey, which is uh, carried out by the member states. However, not annually, but, um, but every five years, uh, so in, in certain waves. So in the dashboard presented today, you will only find the years 2010 and 2015 uh, for these indicators. 
uh, in total, we have included um, roughly 550,000 observations here. So yes, um, Manon will show us in detail in a moment, but um, maybe just two more comments from my side. Um, talking about the additional benefit of the dashboards, um, and Stefan has actually already mentioned it, but let me repeat it uh, from uh, the point of view of the database. Um, so the difference uh, compared to other uh, dashboards is we, we focus on the PRS, on the private renting sector, and we have the possibility to differentiate the tenants and um, compare them to the total population. We have a number of new indicators uh, that are fed in, in the dashboard. And um, yeah, we have this um, additional disaggregation of indicators, not only uh, regarding the, the renter status, but also the region. So we have the subnational level um, uh, in, yeah, with the NUTS 1 and NUTS 2 um, um, <laughs> uh, categories, uh, which corresponds to major socioeconomic regions and um, middle-sized regions, but including also um, cities with over 1 million inhabitants. So this is really something, something helpful. Um, nevertheless, and this is my, my final note, uh, one, one should pay attention to a few points or restrictions on data quality. Um, first, this is the, the regional breakdown, um, a general issue, I would say, in the statistics. So when differentiating uh, by small regions and the rental status, you, some very small case numbers may occur. And so you have to watch out um, regarding the real reliability. Um, then we had the problem that in the course of time, at least in a few cases, uh, regions have been renamed or there have been um, slight shifts in boundaries. Um, changing of names or codes is not so much of a problem, but shifting the boundaries, of course. So um, you might have limits in the comparability and find some few years or, or regions uh, for which data is not available. Yeah, and um, the, the other issue is uh, the HBS or the HBS-based indicators. Uh, we, we need to mention that the HBS data set is based on a gentleman's agreement. So um, it's not a, not a, a regulated um, sample survey, unlike the SILK data set. And uh, yeah, sort of voluntary for the member states. And this may uh, become visible at one point or another regarding data availability or, or quality. Um, so sometimes data may be missing. Um, because they were not recorded or they appeared to be not reliable. So just keep this in mind when using uh, the dashboard. And um, yeah, maybe that it is, it is it from my side at this point. And um, I hand over to Mano. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Naomi. Um, so now I'm going to do a walkthrough of the dashboard. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen and you could let me know whether you see it. Does everyone see? Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, so yes, yeah, so when you uh, come to the dashboard, the first thing you do, you're thrown straight into the map of Europe. Um, so you can zoom in and out as you wish to see a specific country You can click and drag, or you can have the whole of Europe to view. Um, as you prefer. So um, over on the right hand side is the main control panel for the dashboard. Um, as you can see, uh, the years 2004 to 2019, the indicators, the nuts level and the reference group. Um, so you can drag um, the years down uh, to view a um, sort of dynamic change over time, or you can simply just click and view the year that you like. Um, under indicators, uh, you can change in between each of these um, that Naomi mentioned before. So we'll just choose poverty risk. Um, and you can also toggle between national NUTS 1 and NUTS 2. And as Naomi was talking about the issues with the data, you can see as you go through to the different NUTS levels, 
um, the the number of uh, the amount of data available changes quite dramatically. And you can also just toggle again through the years at the different levels. Um, and again, with the reference group, uh, you can look at the population of um, the country as a whole, or you can look at the tenant population within that country. And as you can see, just for poverty risk, that uh, number changes quite dramatically as you toggle between the two. Um, at the bottom of the dashboard, you can see um, a key. Uh, so where it's white, that means there's no data available for that particular indicator for that year. And as the colour gets darker, um, the higher the percentage. Um, so that's great for just an overview. But if you want a more detailed view, you can um, hover over a country. And that brings up in the top right hand corner the specific percentage and also the name of the country or region you're looking at. Um, and as you can see, that um, uh, is in the original language and that stays the same across the NUTS levels. Um, so the data is just one part of the dashboard. Um, we're also looking at policies that affect um, the private rented sector and, um, to tackle energy poverty. So if you click show policies, uh, that brings up uh, a range of policies that we had collected for a previous deliverable in the project. Um, we are on the lookout for more policies always, um, and I'll explain how you can send us those in just a minute. Uh, so at the bottom again, you can see a key. So the different color um, explains which, which category the different policy is in. Um, if you click on a policy, it brings up some uh, basic information. So the name, the category which it's in, the year it started, uh, the scale, which can be national, regional, or local, uh, the implementing authority, and the location um, is where the pin is dropped, so there are coordinate, uh, coordinates embedded in that. Um, you can also see a description of the policy and also links to further information. Um, so some of the policies, um, as you can see, for example, are in very similar places. So if we're looking at Austria, for example, there are four in Vienna. Um, so if you just click on that cluster, that will bring up the different uh, policies that are sort of in that location. Um, so as I said, we're on the lookout for more policies. Um, so if you go to the top left um, and click on submit a policy, it's very simple to do. Uh, the only required fields are the name of the policy the country it um, is applicable to and a link to the website so we can go and look at further information. Um, if you have more information um, available, such as uh, whether it affects local, regional, national scales, the year it started and a description, then please feel free to use that um, and click submit. And then that will come through to us um, where we can moderate that and then also upload it to the dashboard. So as Stefan was saying, um, we also want it to be a um, dynamic uh, resource. So we, at the moment, we only have um, some sort of brief information, but we hope that over time, this page will become uh, a real hub for resources um, on energy poverty in the private rented sector in Europe um, that will sort of be a go-to. Um, and also just the last page is the about page where you can find out more about MPOR, uh, the dashboard, and also uh, the team. And I'd just like to take this opportunity to uh, highlight Lucy Sloss, who was the web designer for this project. And um, she's here today. And just a big thank you from everyone at MPOR for all the work that you did on this dashboard. Um, we think it looks fantastic. So I'll just go back to the dashboard itself. And I think we'll take some questions. Or if anyone wants me to highlight a particular year or indicator, then um, I can also bring that up. I'll leave my screen shared, I think, so uh, that we can do that. So, Stefan, I'll hand back over to you. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, I, I think there's been a number of questions. Um, so I don't know if, yeah, I'm not sure now if people want to open open the floor for, you know, I'd rather open the floor for questions and see if, if there's uh, anything people want to raise. There have been a number of, uh, comments that I've sort of responded to in the um, in the in the chat, but maybe there's more. We've got quite a lot of participants, so please ask away. We also appreciate very kind comments, like amazing work. That's really kind. Thank you. <laughs> 
Yeah, so please, um, there were two questions in the chat. I don't know though if uh, everybody saw it, um, but those could be actually interesting for um, others as well. Um, Jean-Sebastien, um, do you want to go deep in your, in the um, discussion on this with Stefan? Um, if you do, then please uh, turn on your camera and, and your microphone and um, ask the question. Stefan's answer is fine to me. All right, wonderful. Then we go over to the next one. Um, that was about the knots level, what knots level mean. The, this, the answer from Stefan is uh, also in the chat. So um, I, I guess we don't want to repeat that right now. Um, if you're interested, um, go over there. There's also a link um, to Eurostat website with the background information. Thank you, Stefan, for the answer. Um, Stein Hockeger had a comment and a question. Do you want to um, go deep into that, Stein? Then um, please turn on your camera and your microphone and ask your question. Yes, we can see. Hi, you. Oh, fantastic. Hi. Oh, thanks a lot. Hi, hi. Uh, yeah, I think super interesting, super interesting work. And uh, yeah, I was just wondering, maybe I totally missed that, but like, I'm currently like in Ghana and looking also into like heat waves and sort of like and energy access. And I was just wondering, probably because I'm here, but also like the sort of the increasing frequency of heat waves in, in Europe. Um, is would like the inability to keep the house cool also be maybe an interesting indicator like moving moving forward as a sort of um, yeah that I don't know maybe I totally missed that but um, I don't know uh, great work thank you Stein uh, Stefan yeah can I address I the one. question. Yeah, I can ask that one. Thank you, Stan, for the, for the nice comments. Um, the inability to keep the house cool. Uh, we've written volumes and volumes on this about the problems that exist in Europe around that particular indicator. Uh, and debates have been had on Twitter and uh, papers have been written and discussions have been had. The problem is, I mean, I, th I think it's absolutely vital. You've hit the nail on the head there. It's, it's we, we need that indicator. The problem is Eurostat doesn't provide it. Nobody does. Nobody measures this right now. There's only one data module from, I think something like 10 years ago. Naomi can comment on this. Uh, maybe you can tell us about the quality on data on that. Um, it's not sufficiently robust. It's only one data point. There's not much you can do. The moment it becomes visible, we will put it on there because that is another element of energy poverty. It's not just heating. Um, it's, it's appliances also. It's um, hot water. It's and particularly cooling. And we have lots of projects that have shown this. There's problems with cooling the home in places like Northern Germany and Poland and all over France. Um, so Naomi, would you like to comment on that a little bit? Please. Um, yes, um, I was just wondering, Manon, um, maybe you can um, uh, go to the, the list of the indicators, but because I was um, wondering, we have this um, indicator dwelling not comfortably cool, yes. I think. So maybe something, yeah, we can see what, what data we, we find here for Europe. So maybe this helps a little bit to the question. It looks like we have data for 2012 and 2007. Yes, yes, because it was, um, Florine said it was an additional, yeah, oh no, Stefan said it already, additional um, module um, and not repeated since then, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point, actually, and uh, it's what, well, 
does belong to to feeling comfortable in your home, but it also belongs to energy efficiency measures, probably uh, insulating. Um, yeah, the question is where to get the data, right? Um, energy system models use meteorological data. That could be um, an option, um, but that's a question for for further development of the. Um, of the dashboard, um, I think it's worth to duly note that. Um, and let's see how life continues with us. Maybe we will, we will get the chance to um, include data or data measurement factors um, in the future that would improve the dashboard. So, so thank you very much for that comment um, and question. And let's go to the next one. Um, and that comes from Jean-Sébastien. Further question would be, Jean-Sébastien, would you like to share your thoughts with us? Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks for giving the word. Now that, that just to know if from the, the review of data you've done, if you identified the, the countries with the largest uh, differences between the uh, the values of the indicators for the general population and the, the values for the people living in the private rate in the rented sector. Okay, who would like to address the question, Stefan, Naomi or Manon? I'll just say um, that I don't have the answer off the top of my head here, uh, but if you go into the dashboard and explore the data yourself, I think that uh, you can definitely see uh, from the one that I did before uh, on poverty risk um, that it was you know, quite stark. Uh, so I don't have the exact statistics, but um, I think from just even just looking at the data, you can see that there are quite big differences in numbers. Uh, I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything to that. I take that as a no. Thank you, Manon. We have a very interesting question here from Canada, all over. Um, great to have you with us. Um, but I think it's a, it's a very important question. Abby, would you like, from Efficiency Canada, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes, thank you for having me. Um... Uh, it, I'm watching the, I woke up early this morning to saw the Cassie's presentation. Uh, and this is, I re, my mind is completely blown. Now, my question more broadly is uh, how could I, or, you know, folks here in Canada, uh, convince our policymakers that a program, you know, like a dashboard like this is not merely an exercise in like data vanity, but you could actually turn this into effective policy development, or this could actually help us target uh, specific policies and programs towards households that need it the most and so on because uh, uh, I'm looking at where you folks are at and it looks like you're years or decades ahead of where we would like to be and so if we had to start today where would we begin in terms of data collection uh, you know policy alignment uh, and that sort of thing a any advice you can give would be appreciated thank you very much I think that's a, a, a very important and interesting question um, I don't know if we are ready to answer this. <laughs> I think we definitely have the, the, well, it's a, it's a great situation that we have data that we, that we can use. Um, and I'm sure that what, whatever the, um, pandemic showed us is that, that policymakers do listen to data at a certain point and they do listen to science. Um, so I think um, coming from uh, Climate Alliance, which is um, a network of um, municipalities, um, definitely one of the experiences is that if there's a need to handle, um, science can be um, very helpful in answering the needs. So, I would say keep up the good work and um, don't stop bombarding the policymakers with scientific <laughs> facts that is easy to understand and short and concise. And I think this is what the dashboard also does. Um, it will, it is appealing, it is easy to handle, and it gives you the data in a very short 
of time that you would need to, um, you know, set up policy measures. Stefan. Yeah, thank you. I'm just going to answer the previous one as well, uh, a little bit, the one that Jean Sebastian asked, and also this one. I thought I thought they were both very interesting questions. Um, one of the surprises with um, the Rep P indicator is that we got it very high values in countries that don't want to recognize energy poverty as a problem. So if you look through the, the years, you'll see, for example, it's very high in Germany. Um, and that's because Germany has a big private rented sector. Um, it's high in the UK, um, higher than what uh, the UK would uh, have as an energy poverty rate normally. Um, so, and now the data is not going to be available in the future for, for the UK, probably due to Brexit. But if you look in the previous years, you can see it. It's also quite high in Poland, in France, and of course, high in the countries that we normally have associated with energy poverty. On the really interesting question about data and the work that it does and indicators of the work they do, I can comment on this as someone who was involved in really sort of establishing the EU Energy Poverty Observatory, which is now, which is now really kind of gone into a second phase as an energy poverty advisory hub. And we're not directly involved in, uh, well, climate alliances forever, but I'm not. So I can say that the experience of what the observatory has done in terms of impact uh, is, is very significant. Um, and I'm not, I hope I'm not being, I'm not sort of I'm trying to be modest here in a sense, but this is of course an achievement of everyone in the observatory and also the effort of establishing an observatory. And if you, if you look at what, what it did when, you know, five years ago, there was nothing, nobody recognized this thing called energy poverty across Europe. Uh, there was no, there was the, this, uh, this data existed, but it was in different places. So when you create a central hub to make it visible, all of a sudden the media start picking it up and say, oh, wow, there's millions of people suffering from this condition. Somehow it was not, nobody talked about it, but suddenly now it's in the public eye. So when there's an energy crisis, they will go and look at this uh, tool. But then also what's really important is the templates you provide for the indicators, the way in which you decide a particular version of the truth. And I <laughs> sort of being a little bit postmodern say, saying here and saying that indicators are constructs, they're artifacts of, of particular debates and knowledge. So you can present everything here in a different way, of course. But let's say once you put these indicators down, once you create a framework through a particular process, then that becomes a template for policy action. So um, what we saw in the observatory is that soon it became part of European law. So a number of very high level directives started obligating uh, countries to measure and monitor observatory, uh, th to use those indicators as ways of monitoring progress on policy. But even more importantly, they put those indicators in their plans for energy and climate. So all of a sudden it became important to, to, to make sure that not too many people are you know, str struggling for, from energy debt. So the government then will have to find ways of reducing that debt, or they will have to find ways of um, making sure that uh, there, aren't, there isn't too much poor quality housing because then it becomes a benchmark against which you are judged. So in a sense that, that does make a difference in very real and material terms once it becomes a measure that is visible through a platform like this. And the, the dashboard is hopefully going to do a similar role, a similar job for the people in the private rented sector, because all of a sudden vulnerabilities that weren't there, or weren't visible before, are now there in front of you, they're staring you in the face, and you are obliged to act. Thank you, Stefan. We are coming to um, close to our end, actually. Um, and I see several questions here related to um, the content of the indicators. Um, Christian, if you don't mind, I would, um, after we finish this, um, this event, I would put you in touch with Stefan and Naomi and Manon, who would be able to uh, answer your questions more in detail, maybe um, even more, um, because if um, you're doing an energy poverty study in the Philippines, maybe you, um, they can help you um, set up more than just a couple of answers to, to the questions. Um, 
I would like to um, come back to the question related to the regulations, uh, categories of policies. Um, one thing is related to the private rental sector. I would like to also highlight that the energy poverty uh, advisory hub Stefan mentioned as a um, um, continued um, version, or it's not an energy poverty observatory, but it's rather an action related um, advisory hub for local authorities will, I think, collect or is collecting such measures and will um, display. But I think what with the private rented sector concerns, Manon, do you want to address if there's going to be um, adding regulations as category to the report? Yeah, so actually the one that was suggested is already here in the um, in the dashboard. Um, so I think regulation policy measures are used interchangeably. So um, I think some of the, the policies that we have are regulations um, and are enforceable as such as this one in the UK. Um, so perhaps we can make that clearer in the about and information page. Um, but yes, it's it's already here. Yeah, wonderful. So thank you very much. This is supposed to be a short lunch talk so that you also have time to eat. Maybe um, also our uh, wonderful experts here sharing the dashboard. Um, I would say to all, thank you very much for participating. Uh, don't forget to visit our website uh, and don't forget to visit the dashboard. And please don't forget to submit new policies and new measures um, related to the private rented sector. This is very important. Mm -hmm.